uh, speaker is Dr. Christopher Grinfo, who is going to talk about Pope Francis and Peace, a critical green perspective. Uh, Dr. Grinfo is an assistant professor at the Department for Religion and Culture at uh, St. Thomas War College, University of Saskatchewan, as well as a teaching faculty in Catholic Studies and Social Justice <coughs> and the Common Good Miners. His PhD is from the Morrow Center for Teaching uh, Peace and Justice at the University of Manitoba. He also was a doctor of theology student in ecological ethics at the University of Toronto. I just uh, trying to scramble to get this, but uh, what happened is because I'm uh, also a cyclist, and I was caught in the first prairie rainstorm, I've only, uh, most of my copies of my paper were destroyed. Oh, no, no. <laughs> so I have 10, so if you just want to share, there's a couple pictures. Um, and then anyone who really wants it, I'll send it to you. There's lots of them, so you can pass them around. Just take one for every two. If you would introduced me a second longer, I could have gotten there. Sure. So basically what I want to do today is look at Pope Francis' uh, new pontificate and explore how it relates to a green understanding of peace. Um, and I think that this, uh, this is part of a larger paper where I actually campaign, uh, compare him to St. Francis' Peace Witness. Um, so I've pulled apart parts of this, but it's in a pre-first draft stage at the moment. So there's a couple of typos that I fixed that I noticed last night. So I think by, uh, I'll show you the, the origins of this as well, but by invoking, using this name Francis, that he's hinting at sort of the green image of peace um, that he might be moving towards. And when I talk about green peace, I'm going to talk about it as a positive form of peace, which Katarina talked about already today. And this in particular will be as peace is constituting uh, more than the mere absence of war, but peace is incarnated through six principles. Uh, you'll probably recognize these six principles, which are ecological wisdom, social justice, participatory democracy, nonviolence, sustainability, and respect for diversity, which I'll show you those in the words those in a second. So pope, um, every pope and bishop has to choose a motto. Um, Francis has had, since he was a bishop, this motto, and it's miseradio atque legendo. I've passed my Latin, but I don't, I never had to speak it. Uh, which just means lowly but chosen. Um, and this is a very interesting pontificate. Um, it's fascinating for me having studied um, Catholicism quite a bit uh, before I went into these conflict studies as a, as a theologian as a man from a Catholic studies perspective. Um, this pontificate is just fascinating to me. And what's interesting is the excitement around Francis. Even though he's doing some things that other popes were doing, um, it's just a totally new uh, moment in history. And it's still early days, it's just over a year since he's been um, elected pope. One of the most interesting things, if you can see this, is that he was on the cover of Rolling Stone. So if you had asked me this, uh, you know, two, three years ago, I would have said, oh, there'll never be a pope on the cover of Rolling Stone. <laughs> uh, but if you read this story, um, they make him out to be this like big rebel pope, right? But he's not really, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, you can read the story, it's free online, but it always goes story. So what you have to realize is that he has yet to change doctrinal issues. And in fact, on some key issues uh, that are important to my heart from a peace studies perspective, for instance, on the ordination of women, he has said the same thing that popes have been teaching for a while, that the church does not have the power to ordain women, for instance. He said that in his uh, apostolic expectation. That he uh, but that sort of gets glossed over, and uh, it's just an interesting moment right now. But what is, what is going on that is uh, peaceful, I think, in peace building, is that he's sort of refocusing on a sort of cultural change in the church, and viewing the church as a human organization, uh, which is kind of a unique approach um, from recent pontificates, but not solely unique. So he was, uh, before being elected, he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires. He was Cardinal Mario Orgoglio. Um, he was 76 years old when elected, so if you know a little bit of Catholic trivia, you're supposed to re send in your resignation letter when you turn 75 and you're a bishop. Uh, so his resignation letter was actually on file uh, when he was elected. And he's now the 266th uh, pontiff of the Roman Catholic Church. In official, in official Catholic county. Um, so, his father was a railway worker in Argentina. Uh, but it's often presented that his father was a laborer. In fact, he was an accountant for the railway. But he was an Italian immigrant. His mother was a homemaker uh, for five children, and she was a second-generation Italian-Argentinian. So 
there's a lot, I'll talk about this in a second, there's a lot being made about how you know he's from South America, but if you're looking for someone to transition from a Eurocentric papacy, this might be uh, a safe choice in a lot of ways. So he chose the name uh, Francis. It's unusual to take a brand new name. So he's the first Francis. Um, he's the first non-European to take the office for a thousand years. Wow. And so who were, who, where did the popes come from that weren't European before, just to give you a little perspective? North Africa. Yeah, right, because the church was in Africa. Um, so if you think of where the Roman Empire was. He's the first pope from the New World and the first pope from the Southern Hemisphere. He's the first Jesuit pope. Um, I was Jesuit educated. Uh, they used to, where, where the Moro Center is, they used to operate that college um, in Winnipeg, and they run Regis College and Campion College in Regina. Uh, they're a religious order who take a special vow of obedience to go where the Pope sends them. Um, and they are only supposed to take ecclesi ecclesiastical offices of the urging of the Pope. So they're not supposed to seek power. So it's kind of unusual that a Jesuit um, would be a bishop, although there are a number um, in Canada we have a Jesuit. Um, Archbishop of Ottawa, but um, to actually go to that level to be Pope, it's, it's, it seems very strange in a lot of ways. Um, the Jesuits are organized along provincial lines, so he was the Jesuit provincial in Argentina, and you might have heard of this, um, they had to balance conservative politics and the interests of liberation theologians, and that's kind of one of the black marks on his record from a liberationist perspective, is how he dealt with these two uh, Jesuit liberation, the Argentinian Jesuit liberation theologians. Um, but he is known for his humble nature and solidarity with the poor. And he does these interesting pastoral things, like he took public transit in Buenos Aires, even to visit the barrios. Um, in the community that he lived, I don't know if this has been publicized by Mr. Miss talking with Jesuits, but there was differently abled um, <coughs> Jesuits that he lived with, and he helped in the care of those people. And uh, one of, um, who's actually now, he's missioned here to study from Venezuela, studying at the Moral Center, Eduardo, Father Eduardo, he told me uh, that one of his friends was had some business at the Cathedral of Buenos Aires where he had to go see um, the Archbishop. And when he went to the Cathedral of Buenos Aires, Orgolio was there, and he greeted him, and he was so helpful that he assumed that he wasn't the Archbishop, but actually the Norman. So that shows you an interesting uh, pastoral sensitivity. So this is very early days for, for a papacy. Uh, what are the clues of orientation? There's been more emphasis on the local church. He's repeatedly favored uh, identifying his office as Bishop to Rome, right? Which is, um, which is an interesting thing to say, uh, right from the opening remarks. So if you looked right at that moment he was elected, as opposed to identifying himself as the universal pontiff. Um, he has talked, um, talked and lived solidarity with uh, people inclusive of children and those on the edges of society. This concern for the poor has been ever present. Um, there, there is that issue with uh, female ordination, but he's advocated, uh, at least rhetorically, for a greater role for women, um, including perhaps in higher levels of the Curia, the Vatican uh, bureaucracy. He's talked about the rather gender term of, uh, that's why I put it in quotation marks, of tapping into feminine genius and how that's a, an important thing for building peace and harmony in families and with all of humanity. To say without changing access to the higher um, sacramental functions in the church. So the Curia is the Vatican Civil Service, as I mentioned. He's talked about the reform of the Curia as being essential. Um, instead of focusing uh, administrative power of the Catholic Church in Rome, he asked for the Curia to be dispersed, the power of the bureaucracy to be dispersed. Um, and he has this really interesting phrase where he talked about priests and bishops should be pastors that have the smell of their sheep. So if you think of what a bishop is supposed to be, it's supposed to be a pastoral office. You get down there, get that smell on you. So he's, a, he's appointed a new governance structure, um, which is fairly unprecedented, where there's this council of like-minded like cardinals, um, and they're exploring different avenues for consultation. So consultation is supposed to filter through the hierarchy uh, up into this council of cardinals. And it's been a much less scripted papacy. So all these all these scripts that the papal office is supposed to go through, um, he's intentionally violating them uh, with purpose. So what are some of the key symbolic actions? So moving towards a simple papacy, he literally fused the cape of power after being elected, so right from the moment of election. He said that the papal apartments were too big, 
and he moved to an alternative location, which was a priest's residence on the edge of the Vatican City, which allows him better access to regular people. And this is actually significant geographically, because previously, if you went to go visit the Pope, you had to, uh, John F. Kennedy talks about this, going through, um, to get to where the Pope was, the, the audience room in the papal apartments, you had to pass through the bureaucracy. So the Pope was a little regarded by the bureaucracy. And, and you know, it's not, it's not even just the bureaucracy, you have to pass through all these like artworks and splendor works that are like imperial power, right? So it's changing the geography of going and meeting the Pope. He all repeatedly asked people to pray with and for him. Um, and this was a feature of his ministry even when he was an archbishop. Um, and, it won, and it was one that was invoked on those first opening remarks um, last March when he was elected and speaking to the people. He asks uh, all Catholics to do this, but also said clergy have to do this, and that's to, you're supposed to take the perspective of the eyes of the poor when you're making decisions. Say it again. So he's, he's told clergy, in so much as he has papal authority, that when they make decisions, they have to view the world through the eyes of the poor. Through so the eyes of the what? Of the poor. 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 Oh. poor. Yeah, poor. Uh, yeah, which is a loaded term from uh, associated with liberation theology. So he's, um, you know, the Vatican has this um, system of nuncios, right, this papal uh, diplomacy system. And he's directed papal diplomats to report on potential candidates for bishops in their home countries based on criteria of poverty, pastoral skills, and outward simplicity. So he doesn't want uh, people becoming bishops like this Bishop Bling Bling talked about in Austria. Right? He refuses to travel in the papal uh, limousine, and he's generally toned, generally toned down the papacy away from things like the red slippers and the ermine stoles, which are symbols of power. Um, the idea is the church is now supposed to be focused into the world, and a good example of this is there's an office of the Vatican Almoner that used to receive, uh, so you know, giving alms, right, giving charity, he used to uh, receive requests at his desk and then deal with the requests, and Francis literally told him to sell the desk and go to look for the as a function of being a bishop. So this is uh, this is really changing the culture of the Vatican as a bureaucratic organization from consumption to solidarity with the poor. I was talking to one Marianist priest uh, who works with the inter-religious um, office in Rome, and he was saying that the cardinals, there's all these luxury uh, restaurants around the Vatican, and the cardinals and other um, curial members are afraid to go to those luxury restaurants now, and those restaurants are really suffering. A lot of them are closing down. And that's, I think that's a really interesting thing. They're, they're afraid to be seen as living high, right? And that's an interesting uh, shift in the church. So what is this connection uh, with the name? And when he, I mean, when he first chose the name, a lot of people were saying, well, maybe um, this is something like um, to do with Francis Xavier, who's a famous Jesuit. But he's been very clear that it's actually referring back to St. Francis of Assisi. So this is just a little uh, trivia fact. The uh, largest selling Marvel comic of all time is the story of the life of St. Francis. So I put it up there. I like to get that in. <laughs> so this is, uh, I have, I have, does anybody, does anyone else have this comment? It's the largest selling comic. My parents indoctrinated me, I guess. So he, this is, um, this is Francis telling, uh, speaking at, at a papal address. And he says, let me tell you a story. And he was talking about this moment this is part of his style, right? Just let me tell you a story. Uh, when he was talking to a Brazilian cardinal at the conclave that elected him, and um, it looked like the voting was going to go his way, and he says it seemed a, like a bit dangerous that he might win the papal election, and this is the moment he recalls. He says, he hugged me, he kissed me, he said, don't forget about the poor. And that's how in my heart came the name of Francis of Assisi, the man of the poor, the man of peace, the man who loved and cared for creation. And we don't have a very good relationship with creation, do we? The man who gives us the spirit of peace, the poor man who wanted a portrait. He says, oh, how I would love a church, a poor church, and for the poor. So I'm saying that through these statements, we have the links we need um, for the parts of the title for this presentation to come together. Uh, but to fully understand the, the truth or the meaning of this claim, uh, we have to look at what's, what's going on with this word green. So when I take this word green, uh, I'm drawing from green politics. Um, I'm going to try to define sort of a green lens with which to view um, Pope Francis's contributions to substantive peace. This is the word I like, substantive peace. No. 
we, we can talk about that later. We talked about, in our, I, we went through the program together, we always were talking about how to talk about peace. So this is my solution, I'll see if you like it. <laughs> it's not explained here. But anyway, so um, these are the green principles. Um, they're associated with um, green politics. So I'm trying to sort of re reconstitute them in this sort of substantive sort of peace framework. Um, I already listed them. They were discerned through a cross-cultural process and affirmed that it's Global Greens conferences in Canberra and Dakar. Um, and what I think is important about this is a lot of people use this word green. Um, and I have a footnote here about greenwashing, where it's, it's applied to projects and policies oh my, um, um, that, don't, that aren't really green. So I'm just trying to say that it's important to be careful what we mean. And then I wanted to show, although I now I have five minutes, and I thought I was very judicious with my words. Um, how these things are modeled um, in, in Francis's uh, papacy. So principles of eco ecological wisdom. Um, what's, what's interesting is that Francis is reconstituting the human earth relationship in the way that he talks about ecology. And you know these encyclical letters that Pope's release, it's pretty clear that his first encyclical uh, or his first social encyclical will be about uh, ecology, so that's something to look out for. Um, social justice, I think, is related to this call um, for the poor, and I think he's talking about in interesting ways about an integral social justice. I have lots of notes about that that I took out here. I wanted to, this interesting idea that the church could be, Catholic church could be a, a funnel for participatory democracy, I think is previewed in what he's talking about in terms of um, this council of cardinals. But it's really exciting prospect. If you think of the, the church as being this organization that has sort of branch offices all around the world, all the way down to the parish level, it has a geographical component, and there's 1.1 billion people who identify as Catholic. Imagine if that institution could be transformed as a, as a way to filter information, um, to filter decision making. Um, there's, a, there's a potential there, I think. Pope Francis has been very committed um, to nonviolence. And I just wanted maybe to share the, his words here. And he, this is from a pair, uh, day of prayer and fasting for peace in Syria. He talks about in a spirit of penitence to ask from God this great gift of peace, talking about peace as a gift for the beloved Syrian nation and for all situations of conflict and violence in the world. And uh, just this morning he was talking, or yesterday morning I guess it is now, he was talking in the Middle East about how you should never use God uh, to justify violence, where he is right now in the world. Um, I think we have an interesting thing with sustainability and peace going on in our field that uh, Katarina has talked about. And I think what he's talking about is uh, deep relationship building along similar lines to what uh, Katarina was talking about. Um, but um, conceived of as faithfully living in the world. What does it mean to faithfully live in the world? And he's talked about things like uh, we shouldn't have the throwaway culture that wastes um, life and food and connects those two things. He says when a culture wastes food, we know we're in trouble. And respect for diversity, this is pretty interesting from um, the Pope that extends even in areas where the uh, Catholic social teaching is very controversial. So the most perhaps famous incident of this uh, that earned him the Time Magazine cover, so I put that there as well. If he said, if someone is gay and he searches for the Lord and has goodwill, who am I to judge? And he said this in an unscripted moment um, on a plane when he was going to the South America. Um, so says the tendency to homosexuality is not the problem, they are our brothers. And a powerful story um, from before he was came to see that I learned from an Italian-American um, when I was walking in, in Bath is that when he was in Italy doing this curial work, he was part of the Vatican Civil Service, there's a huge stigma against AIDS in Italy, and he went and publicly tried to break that stigma by embracing people who were living with AIDS. So what I wanted to do as my conclusion is just talk about how this is a sort of substantive uh, peace witness that's needed for our time. I'm not trying to claim that it's a perfect peace witness, but it's a very interesting thing to me to see the papal office being exercised in this way and being received in this way in particular. So there's a very famous story of St. Francis making peace with the wolf um, who was attacking this village of Rubio. Um, but there's another story about Francis embracing the leper. I think that this is what um, is going on um, in Pope Francis's papacy in a lot of ways. So this is an example of him embracing a man with neurofibrosis. 
And John Paul II was very good at doing these sort of peacemaking acts that were scripted so photos would get taken. Uh, this was spontaneous, and the good way you can tell it's spontaneous is there's no good picture of it. Right? <laughs> but he's in, uh, embracing that gentleman. So what I, what I think is very interesting, just to summarize it, because I only have uh, a minute left, is that in the Catholic Church, there's a huge conflict between what are often called conservative and liberal uh, Catholics. And both those constituencies right now are excited about Francis's papacy. <clears throat> and that excitement sort of spreads beyond the Catholic Church. And that's very unusual to places like Rolling Stone, right? Very unusual. Um, and I think he's sort of um, like what green politics is trying to do. He's offering an alternative to dominant ideologies, right? And it's not the perfect alternative, but it's an alternative that's oriented towards peace. So it's kind of interesting. So he's moving to transform a culture, moving relationships from fear and mutual destruction to love and mutuality. Um, I think this is a transformative peace witness. And we can see that, um, you know, if I, if I had to bet my house on this, I would say, well, you can see that more firmly in St. Francis' example, especially how it's brought forward. But it's interesting to have this in the early days of the papacy. Um, if he can continue to build on those six uh, principles and maintains this sort of pastoral function of unity, which is what the Pope is actually supposed to do in that office, um, then that can be a really transformative thing in the world. Um, so, but even if it's just a greener piece, I think that's it's not green peace in this in this holistic sense. That's still a good thing. Um, so what I what I say as my conclusion is that I hope and I pray that Francis is laying the proper foundations that will allow for the nurturing of a church for the poor with a global perspective, which he has invoked. Um, Thomas Asolano, who is Saint Francis's biographer, talked about the good thing about Saint Francis was that he made an example. Um, not out of his tongue, right? He made a he made an example of his life became his preaching, right? So could Pope Francis do something like this? And this is the re um, some of you might remember another papacy that there was a lot of excitement about, which was John the Twenty Third's papacy, and he wrote this interesting encyclical um, on peace on earth, and his actual name, um, Giovanni, right? It, he chose because of St. Francis as well. His parents chose that. And that's St. Francis' original name. Francis is actually an international um, adaptation um, for Giovanni because his father was a merchant that sold stuff in France. So, yeah. So Giovanni is John, John 23rd, right? And John 23rd, I, I have this in a big long paragraph to connect this all up, but this is John 23rd signing the encyclical Pachem and Terrace, Peace on Earth. So I'm saying that that's that energy that used to exist. This is, if you had asked me this 10 years ago, who, who would I uphold as a uh, modern or contemporary pope um, in the service of peace, I would have picked John XXIII. So that's what I was trying to connect there. Bravo. Well, we're, we're pretty near the end of our time. Like we're actually at the end of our time. But I wonder if there's any quick questions for Dr. Brinkle. Fascinating presentation. Yes. I have one. 